Welcome, everyone. I'm Ann Greenhall, Deputy Director of the Ann and John McNulty Leadership Program, also adjunct faculty here in the Management Department. And other, under other duties as assigned, I am co-host okay. along with Mike Useem and Jeff Klein of Leadership in Action on Sirius XM Radio, Channel 111. And a number of years ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing our speaker, John Scully, about his book, Moonshot. <laughs> so I know firsthand that you are absolutely in for a treat. And I'd like to introduce and welcome John. He makes a wonderful choice for the Leadership Lecture Series, a series you know that features CEOs. He is a 1963 Wharton MBA graduate, and he's the recipient of 10 honorary degrees, as well as the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. And as I know you know, he is the legendary CEO of Apple, having been recruited from Pepsi to Apple by Steve Jobs with the now famous line, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? <laughs> John Scully was CEO of Apple for 10 years, and during that time, he led Apple to become the largest selling hardware PC company in the world and the most profitable computer company in 1992. John Scully is well equipped to talk tonight on the subject of lessons learned from a disruptive innovator and implications for entrepreneurial capitalism. Over the last decade, he has reinvented himself around the noble cause of reimagining the US healthcare system by low lowering costs that would make the system more sustainable and also by using disruptive digital technology that would provide better care to patients with complex chronic diseases. As members of the Wharton and Penn community, I know that you will be especially appreciative of his talk about lessons learned as an innovative business leader, about entrepreneurial capitalism today, and about what he calls the, quote, exponential time society. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to John Scully. Thank you, Anne. thank you. Well, thank you, Anne. Uh, thank all of you. Really great to be back at Wharton. Um, let me introduce my, my wife and my partner, Diane. Diane is a computer scientist and data scientist, and she and I work together. Uh, we spend our time uh, working with a small number of entrepreneurs in industries that are using disruptive innovation to change the ground rules of those industries. So I would like to give you the, the, the context of uh, why I still do what I do. Uh, that I'm still, I spend my time uh, with Diane uh, going around the world, working with entrepreneurs, um, often speaking at um, universities, and still with an insatiable curiosity. I remember I had joined Apple and been there about three months. I'm sitting around in the Macintosh engineering lab with Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. It's about 10 o'clock at night. Engineers didn't come in until usually noon, and they would still be there at you know, 1 or 2 in the morning, just how things were in those days in Silicon Valley. And Steve and Bill are talking about what they call their noble cause. And I'm listening to this as they say, we're going to change the world one person at a time. We're going to take an idea that Peter Drucker had back in 1959, where he envisioned the information economy. And he described a person in the information economy called the knowledge worker. And they said, we're going to empower the knowledge worker with tools for the mind. And we're going to change the world one person at a time. And that's our noble cause. And you have to understand that Steve and Bill rarely ever agreed on very much. But they absolutely agreed on this noble cause. Now, I'd come from an industry 
that was well defined in terms of the boundaries of the industry. Who were the competitors? I was a veteran of the Cola Wars. And I'm sitting here listening to these two entrepreneurs. Steve was still, when I first met Steve Jobs, he was 26 years old. And here was Steve and Bill, and they're talking about creating an entirely new industry that had never existed before, the personal computer industry. Steve wanted to build computers with no compromises. Bill believed it was all about software. And they're talking about this as a noble cause. Well, that stuck with me over the decades. And it's why when Ann was introducing me, she said, you know, what is John doing now? He's got a noble cause with healthcare. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a, in a few moments. What I want to tell you about right now is what I've learned about people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Andy Grove and others that I worked with who really did change the world. And what made them different? Because they really were different. It goes to a foundation of curiosity. Uh, every one of these individuals that I've met with and worked with over the years just were insatiably curious about things. And Steve Jobs used to say, there has to be a better way. And he and I would go wandering through the Stanford Hill. Steve rarely liked to sit behind a desk. Uh, he was rarely in an office. Uh, he liked to go out and walk. He would walk around the Apple buildings. We'd walk over to Stanford University. We'd walk up in the hills above Skyline. And we spent hours together. And you have to picture that Steve Jobs, in his 20s, was not interested in friends. He was obsessed with making what he called a dent in the universe. And so I spent more time with Steve Jobs than probably any other person on the planet for, th for, th for three years. We were together seven days a week, you know, all hours of, of, of the days. And one of the things Steve loved to do is what he called Zooming. Now, I had learned uh, from one of my favorite professors at the MIT Media Lab, uh, Professor Marvin Minsky. Marvin used to say, you don't really understand something well unless you understand it more than one way. And what Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Andy Grove and several others had in common was they looked at the same facts that everyone else had available to them, but they saw them in a different way. And Steve used to call it zooming. He said, you got to zoom out. You got to look beyond the boundaries of the industry that people understand. And you've got to look at the things beyond that are going to touch the edges of the thing we do understand. And you've got to connect the dots. And so the time that Steve Jobs and I worked together, uh, Steve Jobs had dropped out of Reed College because um, he didn't have the money to pay the tuition. But he still hung around and audited courses. And he loved calligraphy. And then he went off to India. And he spent some time <coughs> meditating. And then he eventually, he and Waz started Apple Computer. And Waz was the technical genius. Steve actually wasn't really that technical. He was brilliant. But he had a designer's mind, a designer's elegance of how to think about things. And Waz was the one who actually knew how to build all of this into technology that could be affordable and easy to use. So Steve was invited over to Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which is where almost every innovation that Apple had used during the time that I worked with Steve Jobs, where it came from. Uh, people in Silicon Valley have never had a problem with borrowing good ideas from somebody else. Nor should you, by the way. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with being inspired by you know, the brilliance of, of other people. In the case of Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, they were developing 
engineering workstations for $80,000. Uh, one was called the Star, and another one was called Alto. And Steve Jobs started connecting the dots. And he said, what if you could take calligraphy and if you could take these $80,000 workstations, which used a graphical user interface, the mouse pointing device, um, Xerox was working with uh, laser printers, which at that time were incredibly expensive. And what if you could shrink all that down in terms of cost and make it a consumer product like we have with the Apple, Apple II? So he connected the dots. And that was when I came into Apple. When I met Steve Jobs, uh, Apple had recently fired their first CEO, Michael Scott. The third co-founder of the company, Mike Markula, had stepped in temporarily. He didn't want the job to be the acting CEO. But Steve really wanted to be the CEO. But he was still, uh, Steve Jobs 1.0 was not Steve Jobs 2.0 in terms of management experience. And so he was considered not only a disruptive, you know, brilliant person, but he was considered disruptive. <laughs> And so the board said, no, Steve, you can be the chairman of the board. You can be the largest shareholder, but you, you can't be the CEO. However, you know, we'll give you the authority to say no to uh, whatever candidate we bring in. Not knowing that they would go through about 20 different candidates to be the CEO of Apple, and Steve turned every one of them down. So finally, David Rockefeller, the Rockefeller family were one of the first investors in Apple said, well, why don't we try another industry in another part of the country and see if we can find someone who will be acceptable to Steve. So when I was introduced to Steve by Jerry Roach, who at the time was the um, most uh, celebrated executive uh, search uh, person at Hydric and Struggles, and I had known a little bit about electronics. I'd been a ham radio operator since I was 13. I'd built experimental color television sets, but this was all analog electronics. This was not digital. I didn't know the first thing about uh, computer technology. But then neither did Steve. You know, remember, it was Waz who knew all, all about the technology. So Steve and I spent five months getting to know one another. And he would come to the East Coast. I was then CEO of Pepsi or I'd go out to Silicon Valley and, and meet with him. And as a result, we got to know each other. And the thing that really captured Steve's imagination, because remember, he had insatiable curiosity. And he said, you got to explain to me, how did you take Pepsi when you joined as marketing VP in 1970? Pepsi, as I had explained to him, was outsold 10 to 1 in about half the country by Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola was the most famous consumer brand in the world at that time. By the end of the decade, Pepsi had passed Coca-Cola to become the largest selling consumer product in America. And he said, so how did you guys do that? I said, well, there's no way we could have possibly competed with Coke in terms of advertising dollars. Their creative was great. You know, they had great people. Uh, there was no un unhappiness with the product. So that's the reality. But as we thought about it, we said, you know, perception leads reality. If we can own perception, then we can change the ground rules of marketing. And we came up with a campaign called the Pepsi Challenge. And the Pepsi Challenge said, take the Pepsi Challenge. It was a blind taste test. We knew that when you did a taste test between Pepsi and Coke and you put the labels on the packages, that Coke always won. But we also knew that when you took the labels off and you did what was called a sip test, a blind taste test, that actually there was a slight margin of preference for Pepsi over Coke. Some people thought it was we had a little bit more sugar. Maybe it was the balance of the uh, essential oils. But for whatever reasons, you know, we would slightly win on average over Coke on a blind taste test. So we created this campaign called the Pepsi Challenge. But it was not about the manufacturer saying, our product is better. 
it was the theme line of take the Pepsi challenge, let your taste decide. So we switched it to the experience. And then we went out, it was at the time when um, uh, video cameras were first starting. And so we went out with little handheld video cameras. And I remember, it was my favorite uh, Pepsi Challenge commercial. We did it in San Antonio, where we were outsold 12 to 1 by Coca-Cola. Now, nobody in their right mind in San Antonio, Texas, even thought about having a Pepsi-Cola. It just never was a, why would they want to have a Pepsi-Cola in San Antonio, Texas? So we did this little taste test. And we would do them in shopping centers, and we would do them on uh, university campuses, state fairs, anywhere we could uh, set one up. And then we made TV commercials of it. And in this particular one, uh, we had three cameras. It was a grandmother, her little eight-year-old granddaughter, who was leaning over her shoulder watching her grandmother as the grandmother was taking the taste test and then the person administering the taste test. So one camera on the grandmother, one camera on the little granddaughter, one camera on the person administering the taste test to give it context. When the commercial was cut and assembled, what it showed was the grandmother saying, I don't know why I'm doing this. I've never had a Pepsi in my life. She takes the taste test. The camera cuts to the little girl. You see her you know, just wide-eyed, looking over her grandmother's shoulder. Then there's the reveal to see what the grandmother chose. And all of a sudden, the little girl says, Grandma, you picked Pepsi. And the, little gra and the grandmother says, I can't believe it. I guess I must really like Pepsi better than Coke. Bang. That was our commercial. <laughs> Coca-Cola was enraged. <laughs> the first thing they did was they went out and they produced a commercial of a chimpanzee taking a taste test. <laughs> and we got our PR people going, and we said, why are they so concerned? And, and the media said, yeah, why are they so concerned? This is the Coca-Cola company. Then they sued us. And so we went out and publicized it as much as we could. <laughs> I used to go market to market when we were introducing the Pepsi Challenge because our bottlers were very weak compared to theirs. So we'd make them get all new uniforms to you know, clean up their trucks, to you know, build up the morale of the organization. We'd have a sales meeting the night before launching the Pepsi Challenge. I remember in Phoenix, Arizona, that Coca-Cola uh, came to our meeting site and surrounded the meeting hall with like um, you know Indians going around the the uh, covered wagons, and they had uh, Coca-Cola trucks, you know, probably 20 of them, you know, circling <laughs> around our meeting hall. So we called up the television news stations and said, "Come on out and see what they're doing." <laughs> Ultimately. Uh, Pepsi passed Coke and became the largest selling consumer product good. And that was called, uh, we called it experience marketing. So I explained this to Steve Jobs. And he said, you know, John, that's really cool. He said, I'm creating this new product and I'm going to call it Macintosh. And it's for non-technical people. And I want them to be able to do creative things. The problem is, Everybody in Silicon Valley thinks this is the stupidest idea they've ever heard because they know the computers are for business people and for engineers and scientists. So why would anybody want you know, a computer for a non-technical person? He said, you've got to come and teach me how to do experience marketing. After being at Apple um, a little over a year, uh, the Macintosh was ready to be introduced. And we had created a commercial. We decided to introduce it at the Super Bowl. And we had done it because in 1983, uh, in October 1983, IBM had introduced something called the PC Junior. And Business Week put them on the cover the week they introduced it and said, the winner is IBM. And we hadn't even introduced our product yet. And uh, we were all sitting around saying, we've got to do something. That, you know, we've got to do something that will really you know, get people's attention. 
And we started to think, well, what's going to go on in 1984? And we went through various things that could happen in 1984. And then we said, well, George Orwell said that in 1984 that the world would be very different, that uh, society would be controlled by information. It would be uh, in the central hands of the government. They'll know everything about you. Actually, it kind of turned out that way. Um, <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, but everyone's going to do, do a, a parody on 1984. But as we thought about it, we said, yeah, but not in January. And so that's why we made this commercial for the Super Bowl, which I don't know if you ever saw it. Uh, you can still go on Google and see Macintosh 1984. But it shows a group of zombie-like um, figures in pajama suits in sort of sepia green um, you know, color, not even a, a full you know, color rendition uh, to make it kind of creepy. And they're marching into this big auditorium, much bigger than what we have here. And on the screen is a talking head. And it's kind of uh, info speak, you know, and the world will be controlled by us, and you will do what we say, and we'll know everything about you. And down the aisle comes this, you know, beautiful Olympic uh, athletic girl. Um, and this time she's in full color, you know, bright red shorts, yeah, um, really good looking t shirt. And she's swinging a hammer. And it's now in slow motion. And as she releases it and it goes through the air, you watch it going and hitting the screen of the talking head. And the screen explodes. And then there's a crawl of type. And a voiceover says, on January 24th, Apple will introduce Macintosh. And 1984 won't be like 1984. And that was the commercial that stopped the world, because uh, we, got, we spent a million dollars of advertising. Uh, I almost got fired by the board of directors when we showed it to them. They said, you're not going to run that thing, are you? And they, they told us to go sell the media time. Uh, fortunately, we weren't able to do it. And we, we ran the commercial. And we got $45 million of free advertising because the television networks just kept running it over and over because no one had ever seen a commercial like this before. And that was experience marketing. So leap forward to today, and experience marketing is what we all know. Because branding today is not the label on the product. You know, branding today is the experience, the relationship between the customer and the brand. There's been a power shift in the world, thanks to all the things we're all familiar with. Uh, two billion people carrying a supercomputer around in their pocket, you know, called a smartphone, to the World Wide Web, to social media, to all of the things that we take for granted t today. And this power shift has done one thing, and that is that people now, customers, pay more attention to the opinions of people they've never met than they do to the reputations of the most famous brands in the world. Now think about that. And think about it in the context of Facebook and what's going on now with, with uh, Facebook. Here is Facebook, clearly probably the most powerful company in the world. Not the most valuable company, the most powerful company. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, and the Pope both manage communities of, virtual communities of about 2 billion people. Uh, face, the Facebook we love is the community where people post their relationships. They share things about themselves and their family. And Facebook has learned how to turn that into an advertising money machine. And it's brilliant. The Facebook we're not sure we love is the media company. The first one is the platform company. The second one is the media company. They don't like to be called a media company. Uh, but the media company has no reporters, it has no journalists, it has a lot of algorithms. And what we've learned, whether it's Cambridge Analytica or others uh, who may be taking advantage of the Facebook data, is that you can manipulate public opinion with a large sector 
of the world population because a lot of people don't want to see a logic behind news. They don't even read news. They see news visually, and it's all about how they feel. One of the most powerful ideas in marketing ever was the concept of the like button. Because if you track when people say, thumbs up, I like this, it says a lot about how they think about things. And so the power of Cambridge Analytics was that they understood whether they did it you know, ethically, legally, or not, we'll all have to see over time. But the reality is that the power of being able to influence people has contributed to populism around the world, has contributed to tribalism of different groups, the, the uh, disintermediation of you know, established institutions, I mean, all of these things. And that's incredibly powerful, and we don't really understand it. I and mean, it's not even clear that, that Facebook fully understands that yet. And so this Facebook event, um, and I was on CNBC last week, uh, right after Sheryl Sandberg, uh, I was asked to comment on her, you know, what she and Mark Zuckerberg were going to do in response to this. And as brilliant as Sheryl is, and she's a great leader, and so, so is Mark, what they've accomplished, they really didn't have good answers in terms of crisis management of what they were going to do. And so they've been getting a lot of you know, um, kind of um, not great publicity since all of that happened. But that's all part of experience marketing. You know, Amazon created Amazon Prime, one of the most brilliant concepts of experience marketing. What is the brand? The brand could be a private label product that Amazon makes. It could be a product that comes from a, a third party. The experience branding is the discovery of what you're interested in, and they can make some predictions of what they think you might like. It can be buy some apparel online, try it on, you don't like it, you can send it back, just as easy as you can you know, order it. You know? It's the time that you can, it takes to, from the time you order to the time in which you get the product. All of those things are part of the experience. And so Jeff Bezos has been brilliant understanding experience marketing. And that's the world we live in today, experience marketing. And so the, the, the Facebook story is you know, a key, key uh, uh, chapter in the events of experience marketing. The third thing I want to talk about is what I do today. And Diane and I are very much involved in our own noble cause, which is healthcare, US healthcare. So th think about this. We have politicians in Washington. It doesn't make any difference whether they're Democrats or Republicans. And they are debating whether we should repair Obamacare or we should replace Obamacare. They're debating the ideology of do we give the states more authority? to make their own discretionary decisions for health insurance, or should we give more power to the federal government and centralize uh, the delivery of, of health insurance? The reality is that our current health insurance system is completely unsustainable, and it has nothing to do with those issues, nothing. So even if they figure out what they want to do, it doesn't make any difference in the context of how do we make our US healthcare system sustainable. It goes back to thinking about what I said at the beginning of the, this talk, that what makes these entrepreneurial geniuses different from the rest of us is that they look at the same facts and they interpret them a different way. They have insatiable curiosity. They become passionate about what they do, and they have the ability to recruit talent to join them to achieve what they want to do, and they want to change the world. They are different, and they do it. And you can see them, you know, a new generation with Elon Musk and Larry Page and Mark Zuckerberg and Sergey Brin, and, and there'll be others after them. It's just going to happen. Some of you may be part of that. So in healthcare, there's no way you can make the US healthcare system sustainable without solving the problem of how do we deliver healthcare in a more efficient way to the most expensive patient, the chronic care patient. 5% of the population 
represents 50% of the $3.2 trillion health spend. Now, I focus on the pharmaceutical part of that health spend because if you look at all of the pharmaceutical expenditures, and that includes the therapies and everything that are sort of connected with prescription drugs, the expanded ecosystem of specialty drugs, of uh, avoidable drug impact medical costs, of uh, the whole PBM industry, pharmacy benefit management industry, added all up together, it's $840 billion a year. Now, McKinsey Global Institute has estimated that of that $840 billion that's spent every year, that $350 billion is avoidable drug impacted medical costs. And most of that is tied to chronic care patients. Because you see, the most seriously ill chronic care patients have typically eight or nine chronic care diseases. These are high comorbidity, meaning if you have type 2 diabetes, you probably have sleep apnea. If you have sleep apnea, you probably have hypertension and so forth. And these people are killing themselves and they're killing our healthcare system too. So what we do at Rx Advance is we built a modern PBM, pharmacy benefit management company. A PBM was created 35 years ago to adjudicate the reimbursements between the pharmaceutical companies, the health plans, the pharmacies, and the providers, the, the clinics, uh, hospitals, and, and uh, physicians. And they're all built on what's called AS400 IBM mainframes, 35-year-old technology. Ironically, it's the same technology I saw when I showed up in Silicon Valley you know, back in 1982. It's the technology that has green screens, command line, COBOL programming. They're still doing it. This is the healthcare industry. You know, every other industry is changing, but not healthcare. And healthcare is still running their pharmacy benefit management systems on 35-year-old technology. And yes, they bolt on other things uh, to be able to add other capabilities, but the reality is it's incredibly inexpensive, outrageously um, complex, and there's no transparency to it at all. And so it's under the spotlight by the government and by others. And you see a lot of mergers going on now with CVS, Caremark, um, you know, merging with Aetna and Express Scripts, um, merging with, with Cigna, and uh, United Healthcare, you know, has bought uh, Catalina, which is now called OptumRx, and so forth. So we built, uh, Ravi Ika, our, our founder, CEO, uh, built the first cloud-based platform for a PBM. And so the company we started in 2013, uh, this year, will do a little over $10 billion of contracted revenue. So that's roughly five years. Uh, we think we can build this company to somewhere between 40 to $50 billion in the range of 2023, 2024, in that, in that time frame. Now, these sound like big numbers, but actually we get a very small percentage of profit. But even a small percentage of profit on a very large revenue base is a lot of dollars of profit. And it, and it turns out we can grow the company without a lot of expansion growth capital. So as, as you know from, I'm sure, your case studies here, that one of the big questions with uh, startup companies is what got us here won't get us there. You know, what get us there usually is once you figure out the concept, you figure out the problem you solve, you've got the right people on the team, you suddenly realize to get us from here to there takes a lot of expansion capital. You know, look, look at uh, Uber. You know, they've raised over $10 billion of expansion capital, and they still aren't profitable. So what's neat about the pharmacy benefit management business is we get paid every week. We actually have a float. You know, uh, so we don't need any expansion capital. Uh, so our business was basically break even last year. And the opportunity to go in to an industry that is not used to disruption, 
and to change the ground rules and to connect the dots in a different way, to interpret the facts in a different way. And I don't take credit for it. I, the credit goes to our CEO uh, founder, Ravi Aika, uh, who saw these things. And so my role is mentor. My role is investor with Diane in his company. My role is to open the doors. My role is to coach and to help him recruit talent. So uh, last year we had 41 employees and 25 other executives, uh, full-time employees in, in um, Delhi, India. By the end of this year, we'll have 400 employees. By the end of next year, we'll have, uh, we believe, 2,000 employees. And we were just with Charlie Baker, who's the governor of Massachusetts, and he'd previously run Harvard Pilgrim, uh, which is one of the largest provider systems in the Boston area. And I was explaining to him, I, not that I had to, he understands healthcare. Uh, I said, Larry Summers had said to me, Charlie, that um, in Boston, we should have been Silicon Valley. And then when life science happened, you know, it should have happened in Boston, but it happened in San Diego. <laughs> and he said, this time, we, we can't lose healthcare. There's just too much going on in terms of talent uh, in healthcare in, in the Boston area. So there are companies like Athena Health, which is incredibly successful. And so we said, we want to be another role model in, in Boston. And so the thing that, that Robbie um, determined, and it makes sense to me now that I understand it, he said, I don't want to hire people from the healthcare industry. He said, because I have to uh, get them to unlearn before I can get them to learn. So he's re recruiting people out of universities. He doesn't need them to have a lot of experience. He said, we'll train them. And we've been doing that, and it works really well. So we recruit talented people. And part of my job now, because I don't run the company. You know, uh, I'm the chief marketing officer. I'm the chairman. I'm a shareholder uh, with Diane. But, but Ravi runs the company. You can't have any confusion about that. So what is my job? My job is to make sure we maintain the culture as we grow the company, that we recruit talented people into the company, and that we give them the proper you know, training so they can be successful in, in, in the company, and to continue to open the doors. That's what chief marketing guys do. So I give you these examples because there are going to be more stories like this in your working lifetime. You know, I remember uh, people coming to me back in the 1980s, and they say, gee, how did I miss all this opportunity in Silicon Valley? Apple's already there, and Microsoft's already there, and Intel's already there. I'm just late to the party. Well, the party is just beginning. <laughs> because the world I have worked in has been uh, a world of disruption with one law, Moore's Law. Uh, Moore's law is that the number of transistors you can put on a similar size uh, wafer scale will double roughly every 18 to 24 months. And it's been consistent like that for 46 years. Well, now we have drones. We have precision medicine. You know, we have artificial intelligence. Uh, we have robots. And we have all of these new disruptive technologies and it's all compounding math. It's all growing at an exponential rate of change. The hardest thing is you don't have to become engineers or technologists if you aren't to be able to participate in this. But you've got to get your head out of linear time and get it into exponential time. Kodak in 2007, and I'm sure everyone in this audience knows the, the story, uh, the largest um, digital photo uh, company in the world, $26 billion market, market cap. In 2007, Kodak was doubling down their investment in silver halide, which was film processing, to compete at a lower uh, price point than Walmart, who was their big competitor with the single-use camera. In 2007, Steve Jobs was putting a radio chip in the iPod and calling it the iPhone. And four years later, Kodak filed for bankruptcy and iPhone 
you know, was leading the world into a, a whole new uh, generation of what technology could do. And it's going to happen again because you got all of these exponential growing technologies. And the thing to think about is China understands this. And they have a different form of capitalism. They have state capitalism. They don't empower their individuals. They empower the state by setting goals. And they'll say, we're going to put in you know, maglev public transportation by this date. We're going to you know, have all motor vehicles be electric by that date. We're going to be the leaders in the world in artificial intelligence by this date, and so forth. We have no capability of doing that. What we have is this incredible entrepreneurial talent of being able to lead entrepreneurial capitalism. But we have to do it carrying the baggage of a political system that can't get anything done. Doesn't make any difference what party you're in. We just can't get anything done. Because our government was set up constitutionally to empower people to participate in government, even though at the time the founding fathers knew not everyone had the education to be able to make wise decisions. So the whole process was separation of power, slow down the decision making, have things happen almost in slow motion, and that was fine for a couple hundred years. But now we live in a world of exponential changing technologies. And now we're living with China that's saying, hey, we can play by a different set of ground rules, we can say these things will happen in this way. And we don't know the outcome of the story. If you haven't read it, you should read, um, I think it's Peter Pillsbury's book, uh, Michael Pillsbury's book, uh, which is called The 100-Year Marathon. And The 100-Year Marathon in China started in 1949 with Mao Zedong. And they've, this is quite a scholarly work. And there are many other books like this. Uh, as to how the Chinese are thinking about things, but it's all in the context of ex exponential time. Now, you may never go to China. You may never work in China. But the reality is that exponential time is going to be just as real no matter where you work. And why is it that GE, one of the most admired companies in my generation, you know, is worth a third of its value of what it was worth in the year 2000? You know, why is it that uh, IBM, that led the world in mainframe computing, uh, got completely outmaneuvered by a startup that uh, was begun inside of Amazon called AWS in 2009. And Morgan Stanley uh, recently did an analysis and said that if AWS, Amazon Web Services, was an independent company, they estimated it would be worth $350 billion. That's two and a half times the market value of, of IBM. So that's the world that you're entering, entering into after you leave Wharton. And the exciting thing is, if you have the curiosity, if you're willing to look at the facts differently, as Marvin Minsky says, you've got to understand something more than one way. The opportunities that you have in your working lifetime, you may even be crazy enough to still want to work when you're my age. But it's going to be such an amazing lifetime that you have ahead of you. And you're coming out of such an amazing experience at Wharton that you are prepared to take on the world. So thank you. Thank you. This is probably an ignorant question because I don't know anything about healthcare, but what is the problem with PBMs and what is RX Advance doing differently? And then more broadly, what do you see as the big issues in the US healthcare that can and need to be fixed? Because you said it's a different problem than the one that people are trying to solve right now. Well, the um, big problem in, in, in healthcare is that the rules that we have in healthcare um, make it incredibly complex to be able to serve chronically ill people. Uh, there are so many regulations. Um, 
there is so much bureaucracy. And McKinsey Global Institute estimates that of the $3.2 trillion that's spent on healthcare, 900 billion of that 3.2 trillion is fraud, waste, abuse, misuse, and avoidable expense. The biggest part of it ties back to pharmaceuticals. The biggest part of the, the cost of pharmaceuticals is uh, attached to the cost of care for chronically ill people. What PBMs do is they manage the health benefits for pharmaceuticals. And unless you can crack that code and can take literally hundreds of billions of dollars, not tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of cost out of that incredibly inefficient system called pharmacy benefit management, there's no way you can make uh, healthcare sustainable. That's the problem that RX Advance addresses. It's a modern day PBM. How are they taking their costs out? Uh, we're, we're doing it with uh, smart process automation. So uh, I, I do a lot of work in, in machine learning and artificial intelligence and in fintech and marketing tech as well. And one of the things I've learned about um, machine learning is that it's very task specific and it really only is commercially successful when you can embed it into something else. You know, just saying that um, machines are, can you know, be autonomous and learn from other machines, of course, that's where the future is. But the reality is today, practically, you want to do something to make money where machine learning uh, can really work is if you embed it into process automation and you make process automation more efficient. So in the case of RX Advance, uh, we are able to take um, several hundred million, when we uh, bid on an RFP, request for a proposal, uh, we'll have to demonstrate, we can adjudicate several hundred million claims, each one different, each one different. Now, each individual is going to be different than the next individual, and that we can do it all, all in real time. No one else can even come close to that. It, it takes them you know, weeks, if not months, to be able to do something like that. We do it you know, instantly. And, it's not that we had to reinvent the technology. We had to learn to adapt the technology to the complexity of healthcare. Thank you. I got one more. Two questions. You've got a question right over here. Oh. Hi, I was wondering how, when, uh, how do you maintain that insatiable curiosity that you talked about when you have a thousand things on your to-do list and you're sleep deprived and you have <laughs> shareholders to please and it's a lot easier just to put your head down and do what you need to do? Well, first of all, I don't work for anybody. <laughs> I don't manage any people. The hardest part of being a CEO are the people responsibilities. Um, the second thing is, that I've always been a curious person. And so, as Diane can tell you, I'm up at five in the morning and I'm on my computer and I'm reading everything I can read. And I'm, you know, email, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I have a, you know, a wide network of relationships. And uh, fortunately, people I've never met, if I you know, contact them, they usually contact me back. And so. <laughs> So, so, so I just I stay connected. Um, I'm in pretty good physical health, so I do Pilates every day when I'm home, and I go out and run, and then I um, do Peloton on the bike, and then I do weights, and I eat well, and I've got a wife who makes sure I do all those things. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm just going to uh, be like the Energizer Bunny. I'm just going to keep going and going and going. How would you say that, um, like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates did that too, when they were CEOs and had had a lot of people to please? Well, um, when I knew Steve, he only did one thing. You know, he, he wasn't married. He didn't have children. He was just 100% uh, was focused on work. Uh, Unfortunately, Steve died. There, there are things which you can't control. You know, he had pancreatic cancer. Um, but I don't think Steve ever exercised. You know, he was very into nutrition. Um, I've never seen Bill really exercise. I've gone horseback riding with him. <laughs> uh, he exercises his brain. He's brilliant. Uh, so, so people do di different routines. You, you have to have a routine. 
I've got the other mic. Do you mind if I ask one more question? One more question and then we'll say uh, thank you. Thank you. So I was wondering, um, I understand the concept of exponential time, um, but I was wondering, and you hadn't quite touched upon this, whether there's a responsibility on our part or maybe on your part because you're the current leader um, to ensure that the benefits of the growth that is going to um, ensue over the next maybe 30 years as it did over the past 30 years don't, uh, doesn't just accrue to a small percent of the population, um, especially uh, in the developing world as it has so far in the US? Well, the reality is that the simplest way to think of exponential time is what used to happen in six years happens in six months. And you're absolutely right. The, the benefits of exponential time, uh, the rewards go disproportionately to a small number of people. I don't know how to fix that. Uh, and you, there are a lot of ideas out there from universal basic income to um, you know, bigger roles for the, for the state. The interesting thing is, is that your generation actually uh, is far less enthusiastic about capitalism than my generation was at your age. And there may be good reasons for that. You know, I happen to believe in entrepreneurial capitalism. That's what I do. Um, but, but the reality is not everybody you know, interprets the benefits of capitalism the same way. And if you think about your generation, let's say for the rest of the century, it, it sounds a little weird that the whole century is going to go on with all of the wealth concentrated in a small percentage of the population and that that can be sustainable. Now, I don't know, will it change, how it will change, Will it happen over 50 years, five years? I don't honestly know, but you'll get to see. I won't. You'll get to see it. Uh, and, and maybe you'll figure out a different construct of the society that, that, that you and your generation want to live in. Uh, you, for, for example, um, have you ever been to WeWorks? I have, yes. yeah. Um, when I was going around to get a, you know, a tour of the campus, um, I looked down. Uh, at the John Huntsman um, building, and it looked like WeWorks uh, when, I, when I went to um, visit Adam Newman, the founder of WeWorks. And when you look at um, how their new concepts of uh, creating new cities, and that we know that, that the people are going to, you know, more and more people are going to be living in cities. They're probably going to be new cities. They'll be smart cities. Uh, it may be more communal than what my generation was used to. So I grew up in the suburbanization of America and the interstate highway system and nationwide television. All those things were, were built in my lifetime. In your lifetime, you're going to see the, the building of entirely new infrastructure, entirely different than what has occurred in my lifetime. And out of that may come derivative uh, results that address the issue you're raising, which is you know, how do we deal with this issue that in all likelihood, most of the benefits from the innovations I'm talking about are going to a very, very small percentage of the population. Maybe those ground rules will, will be changed by your, your generation. If we st stick with what it is now, um, I don't know the answer. Thanks. Thank you. spending time with us, reminding us to stay curious. We are not too late to the party. The party has just begun. And with that, John, we'd be very honored if you would accept a small token of our appreciation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.